All right, how's everybody doing today? Hotel. Hey, this is Michael M. Hotel, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, and writer. Today is Sunday, April 1st, 2018. Sunday, April 1st, 2018. And we are live. Share this broadcast on your own Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in also. And uh, this is not a April Fool's joke. All right. Maybe we'll talk about uh, some point later today. We may talk some about the history of April Fool's. I have some information on that. But uh, this presentation is dealing with um, a anniversary I did not have a chance to talk about uh, in the month of March. I was so busy in the month of March and saw this information and knew about it beforehand, but did not have a chance to talk about it, okay? And this deals with the commemoration of the uh, abolishment of um, the U.S. involvement and the British involvement in the international African slave trade, okay? And the passing of this bill by the U.S. Congress the passing of this bill by the US Congress, which was March 2nd, 1807, all right? And um, March was so busy, you know, and it's a, it's a bunch of topics that uh, have gone by and I've made a note of, and I have not had a chance to talk about. So you'll see some uh, future Facebook Live broadcasts dealing with uh, some various topics, all right? Okay, so um, everybody, uh, share this on your Facebook page, invite your friends to tune in. And those in the Baltimore area, I want to let you know, I'll be in Baltimore Saturday, April 7th, uh, Sunday, April 8th at the um, 17th Annual Baltimore Natural Hair Care Expo, 17th Annual Baltimore Natural Hair Care Expo at the UMBC Event Center, UMBC Event Center. Um, I'll be doing two workshops there, Great African Women in History, the Mothers of Civilization. And I'll have a vendor booth there as well. So visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com uh, for more information. OK, come on out and see me in Baltimore, Saturday, April 7th, Sunday, April 8th, 2018, uh, 17th Annual Baltimore Natural Hair Care Expo. And I'll be doing two workshops dealing with Great African Women in History, the Mothers of Civilization. Great African Women in History, the Mothers of Civilization, and I'll deal with the Black Panther film also. All right, so let's jump right into this, okay? And let me pin this here on the uh, homepage so it stops moving also. Just a second. All right, there we go. All right, so a lot of people know about some, a lot of people know some about the U.S. Civil War, uh, and they know about some about the um, uh, transatlantic slave trade, right? But a lot of people don't know about the U.S. abolishing the pat pass uh, the law actually passing Congress to abolish the importation of uh, enslaved Africans. Okay, abolishing the importation of enslaved Africans. So this took place. Uh, this um, uh, bill passed Congress March second, eighteen o seven. March second. 1807. All right. So the anniversary was last month. All right. And didn't have a chance to talk about it at all. All right. So um, history.com has an article about this as well as politico.com and a really good article from a uh, historian, Eric Foner from the uh, New York Times. But uh, the U.S. Congress passes an act to, quote, prohibit the importation of slaves into any port or place within the jurisdiction of the United States from any foreign kingdom, place, or country. Let me repeat this, okay? Because a lot of people don't know about this. The US Congress on March 2nd, 1807, so this is 10 years after the US Constitution is signed, right? US Constitution signed September 17, 1787. It passed 1788. The US Congress passes an act to, quote, prohibit the importation the importation of slaves into any port or place within the jurisdiction of the United States from any foreign kingdom, place, or country, okay? Now, this did not end the practice of 
enslaved Africans or enslaving African people within the United States. This dealt with bringing them into the United States, okay? All right, so you hear in 16, in 2019, we're coming up on the 400th year anniversary of August 20th, 1619, right? So a lot of people say, as well as history.com, and history.com has some good information, but you have to be able to parse some of it. But according to this article, it says the first shipload of African captives in for the first shipload of African captives to North America arrived at Jamestown, Virginia in August 1619. So they're referring to August 20th, 1619. But for most of the 17th century, European indentured servants were far more numerous in the North American British colonies than were African slaves. OK, so in general, part of that is correct. Um, 17th century, you're dealing with the 1600s, right? Yes, you have European indentured servants. It's going to be after about 1665 or so that you're going to um, have a uh, expansion more so of enslaved Africans. In some sources, in this article, they talk about 1680, okay, which is after 1665 as well. However, one, as you've heard me talk about before, and is absolutely correct, one, uh, African people were here in this land we call the United States of America tens of tens of thousands of years before um, August 20th, 1619, Jamestown, Virginia, before um, we were enslaved, number one. We deal with the Khoisan, who have the oldest DNA on the planet. You can read the first Americans were Africans, documented evidence by Dr. David M. Hotep, who deals with this information thoroughly. OK, so number one. Number two. Um, when you look at the Spanish territory of what today we call South Carolina, the Spanish were taking Africans into the territory of South Carolina uh, about 100 years before Jamestown, Virginia, August 20th, 1619. OK, because the Spanish were involved in the transatlantic slave trade um, before the British got involved. All right. So August, so uh, in the 1520s, the Spanish were taking enslaved Africans into uh, South Carolina, okay? This is about 100 years before August 20th, 1619. So when people say, and I hear people say all the time, we first came to these shores August 20th, 1619, even though that did happen, that's not historically correct. We were here tens of thousands of years before that, but even as enslaved Africans, we were here at least 100 years before that, okay? So when we look at the article from history.com, it says that um, European indentured servants were far more numerous in the North American British colonies than were African slaves. Now, this is early on. They're talking about in the 17th century, the 1600s. They said, however, after 1680, the flow of indentured servants sharply declined, leading to an explosion in the uh, African slave trade. By the middle of the 18th century, middle of the 1700s, slavery could be found in all 13 colonies and was the core and was at the core of the southern colonies agricultural economy the pop the, the the climate in the southern colonies which are later which are going to then become the southern states was more conducive to the growing the crops on the large plantations like cotton and things like this is more conducive to that it's going to happen uh in the northern colonies but is going to be the the climate in the in the south is going to be more conducive to growing a lot of these crops, okay? So, um, and one of the other things is you're going to start having a curtail, curtailing of the indentured servants, the white indentured servants. 1680 is five years after Bacon's rebellion of 1675 and 1676 in the colony of Virginia. Bacon's rebellion, B-A-C-N, B-A-C-O-N apostrophe S, B-A-C-O-N apostrophe S. So Bacon's Rebellion, it occurs in the colony of Virginia, and you have these European indentured servants, these white indentured servants, who unite with enslaved Africans to fight against their common oppressor, the ruling class, because they realized they had a common oppressor. Now, if you, if you read Before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett Jr., he talks about Bacon's Rebellion in there, and I think it's chapter two, the African past, I think it's chapter two. And um, is around page 40 in the sixth edition. Just a second, I'll grab it. Okay, so it's right here. 
and my copy is an old copy. That's why it came apart. Okay. <laughs> All right. So it's, it's around page 40, page 42, and I'll give it to you exactly here. Um, page 40 in the sixth edition, page 40 and 41, before the Mayflower of Rome Bennett Jr. And he talks about how the legal document, so we're looking at one, two, three, third chapter, th third paragraph from the top, third paragraph from the top, sixth edition, before the Mayflower. Of all of the improbable aspects of this situation, the oddest to modern blacks and whites is that white people did not seem to know that they were white. He's talking about in the 17th century, in the in the British colonies here in what we call today United States of America. He said it appears from surviving evidence that the first white colonists had no concept of themselves as quote unquote white people because at this time the, they were not using the term white in these British colonies. The legal documents identify whites as Englishmen and or Christians, Englishmen and or Christians. The word white, W-H-I-T-E, with its burden of arrogance and biological pride, developed late in the century, late in the 17th century, okay? It's going to be after Bacon's Rebellion in 1675 and 1676. As a direct result, so he said it developed late in the, in the century as a direct result of slavery and the organized debasement of Blacks. The same point can be made from the other side of the line. For a long time in colonial America, there was no legal name. There was no legal name to focus white anxiety. The first blacks were called Blackamores, B-L-A-C-K-A-M-O-O-R-S, Blackamores, or Moors, or Nagars, N-E-G-E-R-S, and, ne and Nagers, N-E-G-E-R-S, and Nagars, N-E-G-A-R-S. This is page 40, chapter two of Before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett Jr., sixth edition. Chapter two is called Before the Mayflower. He said the first blacks were called Blackamoors or Moors, Nagers and Nagars. He said the word negro, N-E-G-R-O, a Spanish and Portuguese term for black, did not come into general use in Virginia until the later part of the century. This is still dealing with colonial times. So they're talking about the 17th century, the 1600s. Okay. And he says a similar course of development was roughly characteristic of New York, where the black settlement preceded the English. Okay. But when you understand history, this is it comes after Bacon's Rebellion in 1675 and 1676, because the, these these European indentured servants saw they saw their condition was more related to the enslaved Africans, and they saw that they had a common enemy, which was the ruling class, the, the, the European ruling class, the white, the British, English ruling class. And they united to fight against them. After Bacon's Rebellion is put down, this is 1675 to 1676 in the colony of Virginia, then the ruling elite are then going to institute, the, they're still going to, then they're going to use the term white to describe what we call white people Europeans. But it was designed to separate these European indentured servants from enslaved Africans and bring them into the family of whiteness, bring them into the fraternity of whiteness and say, hey, you're on our team, okay? They're gonna give them some land, things like this, but say, hey, you're on our team to separate them from enslaved Africans. And as he, as he talked about early on, in the 17th century, the term Negro was not used in the British colonies. And the term Negro was a Spanish and Portuguese term. But they're gonna then use these terms to then divide these two groups of people, these European indentured servants who the ruling class of Great Britain is exploiting and the enslaved Africans who the ruling class of Great Britain and through the colonies are exploiting also. 
a lot of these descendants of these of these Europeans who were exploited by the ruling class, a lot of their descendants today are Donald Trump supporters, still being exploited by the ruling class, even though they think Donald Trump is for them and he never has been for them. Okay, <laughs> and you can study his history and see this. All right, so how's everybody doing? All right, share this broadcast on your own Facebook page, invite your friends to tune in also. And uh, also we'll, we'll talk a little bit about um, the um, online uh, courses that I teach, especially the online class I teach called Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. OK, that's a four. It's a seven session, 14 hour online course that I teach. We just posted a link there. We have a bundle pack where you can register for all six of my online courses as well. Watch them over and over again. OK, page 41 of Before the Mayflower, then we'll go back to the article from History.com. A similar course of development was roughly characteristic of New York, the colony of New York, where the black settlement preceded the English and the name New York. There are records from 1626 identifying 11 blacks, about 5 percent of the non-Indian population who were servants of the Dutch West Indian company. So you're going to have these um, European nations uh, organizing these slave trading companies, and they're going to finance these slave trading companies. One of them was the Dutch West Indian Company. You had the Dutch East Indian Company, the Brandenburg German Company, things like this, right? They, they were financed by wealthy people. Okay, yeah, this uh, page 40 and 41 of Before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett Jr., chapter two, page 40 and 41. OK, now the 11 black pioneers were males. They're talking about in the colony of New York. All right. Responding to the pleas of these males, the Dutch imported three women identified as Angolans, A-N-G-O-L-A-N-S, Angolans in 1628. New York, before it was a British colony, was a Dutch colony. It was called New Amsterdam. OK. So you, so you got to understand this chronology of history. All right. OK, so let's go back to uh, and this is uh, before the Mayflower. Lerone Benigi, we know Lerone Benigi just passed away a couple of months ago. Right. All right. So just trying to put together some historical context. Now, by the time of the American Revolution, the English importers alone alone have brought some three million uh, captive Africans to the Americas. So the American Revolution starts 1775. Okay, they always lowball these numbers. It's uh, probably more than three million at this point, but they always lowball the numbers. All right. Now, after the American Revolutionary War, as slave labor was not a crucial element of the northern economy, most northern states passed legislation to abolish slavery. However, in the South, the invention of the cotton gin in 1793, and then you're going to have copies of the cotton gin that are going to be created also. These are going to make cotton a major industry and sharply increase the need for slave labor. OK, now also three, 10 years later. So 1793 cotton gin is created. Right. Ten years later, the Louisiana Purchase of 1803. The U.S. gets 828,000 square miles of land for less than five cents an acre or less than three cents an acre. Actually, they get it for about 15 million dollars. It's going to double the territory at the of the U.S. It's going to give the U.S. more land to plant crops. And it, this increases the need for slave labor in some of these territories. They tried to have a balance between free territories and, and slave territories, but it's going to give the U.S. more land to plant crops, which is then in turn going to increase the uh, uh, need, the demand for enslaved African labor as well. One of the things you're going to find, why the, one of the reasons why the U.S. also moved away from um, white indigenous servants is because these Europeans could run away and blend in with the majority of the white population. OK, <laughs> whereas enslaved Africans, if they run away, they're going to stick out more. OK, but you have a, a white indigenous servant from, from from England. Hell, he could run away and blend in with the white English population. 
Okay. All right. This is one of the reasons. All right. So uh, tensions arose between the North and South as the as the uh, as the slave or free status of new states was debated. Okay. Um, so they're dealing with um, 1793 and on. All right. This is uh, after 1793 is uh, uh, five years after the uh, U.S. Constitution is passed in 1788. Now, in January of 1807, January of 1807, with a self-sustaining population of over four million slave enslaved Africans in the South, okay, some Southern congressmen joined with the North in voting to abolish the African slave trade. Now, this is the importation of enslaved Africans. It's not the practice of slavery in the country, it's the importation. An act that became effective January 1st, 1808, okay? So it passed Congress March, March 2nd, 1807. And last, last month, March, I was so busy, I didn't get a chance to broadcast on the, on the anniversary of this bill passing Congress. Now, the widespread trade of enslaved Africans within the South was not prohibited, which means that the practice of selling enslaved Africans in the South continued. That was still legal. It's the importation that became illegal January 1st, 1807. OK, so the widespread trade of slaves within the South was not prohibited, was not prohibited or was not made illegal. However, and children of enslaved Africans automatically became slaves themselves, thus ensuring a self-sustaining slave population in the South. Now, Great Britain also banned the African slave trade in 1807, the importation, but the, the trade of African slaves to Brazil and Cuba continued until the 1860s. By 1865, some, uh, so they lowballed this number once again. By 1865, some 12 million Africans had been shipped across the uh, Atlantic Ocean to the Americas, and more than 1 million of these individuals had died from mistreatment during uh, uh, the voyage. They lowballed these numbers once again, okay? Um, in addition, an unknown number of Africans died in slave wars and forced marches directly resulting from the Western hemispheres. Uh, demand for African slaves. Now, if you saw the, it, well, if you listen to the interview I did with Dr. Jahi Issa and Brother Reggie Marbury, and you can read the article they wrote for Black Agenda Report, okay? We know that, uh, see, some estimates say that, well, they all say that the importation of African slaves continued after January 1st, 1808. So the U.S. was in violation of their own bill that they passed, of their own law, okay? They were in violation of this federal law. But in one of these articles here, I think it was the one from Politico.com, they said 50,000 Africans were brought in after January 1st, 1808. No, the new, the new research shows 3.5 to about 4 million were brought in. They continue to do this. They continue to do this in violation of their own laws. So, so the longstanding notion was that the popular after 18, after 1807, the increase in the population of enslaved Africans was due to forced breeding and the uh, stu the studying of African men and the breeding farms and things like this. That did happen. But what's not talked about a lot is that the U.S. and, and, though, and, and those involved in the slave trade violated their own federal law outlawing the importation of enslaved Africans. So when you read the article from BlackAgendaReport.com, BlackAgendaReport.com by Dr. Jahi Issa, who's a professor of uh, Africana studies, African-American studies, things like this, and Brother Reggie Marbury. They talk about various cases where you have white people who are, who are uh, prosecuted for violating these laws, okay? But you're still going to have somewhere between 3.5 to 4 million enslaved Africans that still come, still are brought into the U.S. during this, for, 
through the international slave trade in violation of this federal law, okay? So if we look at the, uh, so the name of our article from blackagendareport.com was called uh, Reparations is Dead, Here's How to Revive It. Something like that. Reparations is Dead, Here's How to Revive It. That's from blackagendareport.com. Let's see if we can pull up the link of that article as well. All right. Okay. So you look at the article from black, uh, from political.com, political.com from uh, March 2nd, 2018. Um uh, Congress votes to ban slave importation March 2nd, 1807. Now, what's interesting is that on the 200th year anniversary of the, the uh, abolishment of the importation of enslaved Africans in, in Great Britain, because in 1807, Great Britain uh, uh, bans this as well. They signed, they signed it into law also. Uh, 2000, uh, 2008, okay, um, was basically the 200th year anniversary of that going into effect, all right? Great Britain had celebrations around this, largely. They had celebrations. This was largely recognized in Great Britain. In this country, country, it was not largely recognized. I saw a couple articles about it from like CNN, but it was not largely recognized in this country. So if we look at political, uh, their article, Congress votes to ban slave importation, March 2nd, 1807. On this date in 1807, Congress enacted a, a law to, quote, prohibit the importation of slaves into any port or, or place within the jurisdiction of the United States from any foreign kingdom, place or country, end quote. So the ban took effect January 1st, 1808. Now, by the time the lawmakers acted, every state except South Carolina had already abolished the slave trade. That's the importation of slaves, okay? By the time this went into effect, every state except South Carolina had already abolished the basically the importation of slaves. Now, this legislation was, was promoted by uh, President Thomas Jefferson, who became president in 1808, uh, sorry, 1800, became president in 1800. Thomas Jefferson, who called for its enactment in his 1806 State of the Union address and who favored acting on the issue since the 1770s, okay? Now, he didn't free his enslaved Africans, all right, because he wanted to end the importation of African slaves. He kept them. Now, his views reflected the trend toward abolishing the international slave trade, which Virginia followed by all the other states, had banned or restricted since the prior decade. South Carolina, however, had reopened its trade. Now, keep in mind, see, South Carolina is a curious, curious colony, later state, um, because South Carolina was the first state, well, South Carolina was the first state to secede from the Union December 20th, 1860, which leads to the Civil War. And South Carolina is where uh, Civil War starts, August 12th, 1861, with the attack on Fort Sumter, okay? In, in South Carolina. So South Carolina is a very, very curious, curious state. Okay, so the name of that article from blackagendareport.com, Reparations is Dead. Authors seek to spark public discussion of new legal strategy, okay? Uh, this is from um, Dr. Jahi Issa and Reggie Marbury, uh, and Patrick uh, Delicis also, D-E-L-I-C-E-S, I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name. Um, the authors elaborate on their contention that activists have bungled the legal battle of reparations. They are willing to debate in COBRA, December 12th. They, they are willing to debate in COBRA, the December 12th movement, Dr. Ron Daniels, Assemblyman, Assemblyman Charles Barron, Dr. Claude Anderson, Randall Robinson, Ta Nehisi Coates, and others. I interviewed these brothers on my radio show, the African History Network show. Um, we did a two-part series. So you can go to AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and uh, just search for reparations, and you those two shows will come up. You can go back and listen to them, all right? We posted the link here to that article on the thread of the broadcast also. How's everybody doing? How's everybody doing today, all right? I know it's Easter Sunday. So, you know, normally I broadcast Sunday nights, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the African History Network show on 9, 10 a.m. the Superstation. Because today is Easter, 
Um, a lot of the talk show hosts are not broadcasting live tonight. So they didn't, uh, so they shut down the radio station for today. I was willing to do my show, but I don't think uh, a board operator was going to come in. They didn't have enough talk show hosts to, to have the board operators come in today. So, you know, hey, we're broadcasting here. All right. But I was willing because I'm willing because I know next Sunday I'll be in Baltimore and I can't broadcast live. All right. So we're going to continue here in just a minute. Hey, if you like this type of information, register for my online courses and they, they are on demand. OK, you can watch uh, anytime. Um, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Because I, I deal with a lot of this type of information, go more in depth into it. It's a seven session, 14 hour online course with 20 hours of bonus content. And you can watch it over and over again. Uh, that's at our online school, the African History Network School. And uh, that course is $50 by itself, but we have a bundle pack where you get six of my online courses, including that one on the transatlantic slave trade. And the online lecture I did yesterday dealing with the film Black Panther, you get all that for $80, regularly $120, okay? So we posted the link there uh, on the thread, or you can go to AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and uh, you can register there. As soon as you register, you can start watching. You can watch all around the world. Okay, please share this broadcast uh, on your Facebook page, all right? So let's continue here. Okay, let's continue. Can you see me with my Black Panther t-shirt on today that I bought from my, from my man, brother Khalil, African-American vendor here in Detroit. So let's go back to this article from political.com. Then I wanna go to this really good article from um, the New York Times from historian Eric Foner. Okay, so the legislation was promoted, the legislation to end the, uh, the, the US uh, involvement in the international slave trade was promoted by President Thomas Jefferson, who called for its enactment in his 1806 State of the Union address and who favored acting on the issues since the 1770s. His views reflected the trend toward abolishing the international slave trade, which Virginia followed, um, which, which, which Virginia then followed by all the other states had banned or restricted, banned or restricted since the prior decade. South Carolina, however, had reopened its trade. Now, with the self-sustaining population of more than 4 million enslaved Africans already living in slave-owning states, some Southern congressmen joined with Northerners to enact the ban. However, internal slave trading through the South remained unimpeded by legislation. It was still legal. Children of slaves also became slaves, ensuring a growing slave population. OK, moreover, historians estimate that up to 50,000 slaves were illegally brought into the United States after 1808, mostly through Spanish Florida and Texas before those states were admitted to the Union. But we know it was much more than 50,000, It's basically between about 3.5 million to uh, about 4 million. And if you uh, look at the article that I posted from um, Dr. Jahi Issa and Reggie Marbury, uh, they talk about that based upon new research. OK, so and this was largely to cover up the, the, the low balling of the number that was still coming into the U.S. OK, after. Congress passed this law. Banning the importation of slave Africans was largely designed to 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 cover up what was really taking place. So in in 1820, slave trading became a capital offense with an amendment to the 1819 Act to protect the commerce of the United States and punish uh, the crime of piracy, punish the crime of piracy. A total of 74 cases of slaving were brought to the United States from 1837 to 1860, but few ship captains were convicted and those who were usually received trifling sentences which they often could avoid. So this is dealing with enforcing that treaty. See, a lot of people don't know, you had white people who were prosecuted for violating this act, but overwhelming majority of them were not sentenced. Okay, well, I'm sorry, the overwhelming majority of them were not uh, convicted, okay? But you're gonna have some white people who are 
brought up on charges. In some cases, you're going to have some threatened with death. You're going to have a, a few who are convicted, things like this, right? But a total of 74 cases of, of slavery were brought into the United States from 1837 to 1860, but few ship captains were convicted. And those who were usually received trifling sentences, which they often could avoid, okay? You're all going to have some exceptions to the rule. In 1619, the first African slave ships had arrived in Jamestown, Virginia. We know they were coming before then in South Carolina. In appealing to basic human liberty, the American Revolution against Britain's King George III, which began in 1776, put the uh, institution of slavery into sharp focus. OK, well, it starts in 1775, the American Revolution. The 13 colonies breaking away from Great Britain. King George III was the monarch. Many of the founding fathers assailed slavery, singling out the slave trade from Africa for condemnation. Several of the founding fathers, however, including Thomas Jefferson, George Washington and George Mason were slave owners. So you're going to have some who signed this whole, yeah, 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence. You're going to have some who are not slave owners. You're going to have a lot who were. OK, so um, and the slave trade was in contention during the Philadelphia Convention of 1787. This is why there was a 20 year clause in the um, Constitution to protect the slave trade. And then after that, then abolish it after a 20 year period of time, the importation, abolish the importation. So at the Constitutional Convention of 1787, so the spring of 1787 in Philadelphia, you have a Philadelphia Convention. You have the drafting of the U.S. Constitution, largely by Thomas Jefferson, and you have it being debated, okay, by the delegates, right? So the slave trade emerged as an acrimonious issue. Finally, a compromise was reached with the Southern states that guaranteed the continuance, the continuance of the slave trade for 20 years after the uh, adoption of the U.S. Constitution. So, so the um, passing of it in 1807 didn't just happen, right? This is at least 20 years in the making, okay? Finally, a compromise was reached with the Southern states, and let me bring this up here, okay. Finally, a compromise was reached with the Southern states uh, that guaranteed the continuance of the slave trade for 20 years after the adoption of the U.S. Constitution, right? So 1787 plus 20 is what? 1807. That deal set the earliest possible expiration date as 1808, one which Congress met. So this was at least 20 years in the making. So Great Britain also banned the African slave trade in 1807, the importation. But the but the uh, trade of African slaves to Brazil and Cuba continued until the 1860s. Now, according to Politico and their research, which once again is a low ball number, by 1865, some 12 million Africans had been shipped across the Atlantic to the Americas. Um, okay, so we know that's, we know that's a low ball number. We know that you had. We know you had at least 100 million who were from 1440 to about the 1860s or so. We know you had at least 100 million who are either going to be captured, die in raids, die on the way to the slave dungeons that were along the west coast of Africa. Um, die on the way to the final destinations, things like this. So Dr. John Henry Clark, I think, was correct when he said we start our count at, at 100 million. And it does not mean 100 million enslaved Africans came to the United States. That's no, 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 no. That's not true at all. Of those that of those that are actually captured during the transatlantic slave trade, uh, only about 5 percent come to the U.S. The, the majority do not come to the U.S. The majority go to South America, especially Brazil, and they go into Central America. They go into the Caribbean. They go into Central America. They go into Caribbean, Cuba, Haiti, Jamaica, things like this, right? 
Um, okay, so that's an article from Politico. Congress votes to ban slave importation March 2nd, 1807. And that article is written March 2nd, 2018 by Andrew Glass. All right. So there was a really good article from um, New York Times, December 30th, 2007, which was two days before the 200th year anniversary of January 1st, 1808, when the law, when the bill that passed Congress actually went into effect, right? Actually went to effect January 1st, 1808. OK. All right. So let's do this. Let's go to some of your uh, let's go to some of your questions, comments here. Let's see. Let's go back. And then um, and also what we'll do before we get out of here, I'll do a brief like 10, 15 minute overview of uh, my online class that I teach ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. OK, we'll do with some of the content that we deal with in the online class, all right? Because you can register for that. It's a seven session, 14 hour online class that I teach. It's all on demand. I did it uh, with August and September of last year. And we go more in depth in a lot of this information. And there's also 20 hours of bonus content as well, okay? So uh, we'll post the link again for that. And then uh, we'll go to your comments also here. And you can you can uh, register for our six course online bundle pack, which includes the one on understanding the transatlantic slave trade and the online class I did yesterday dealing with the film Black Panther. Also, OK, that's eighty dollars and it's readily one twenty You can watch from around the world. Uh, Larry Hill said twenty and odd. Yeah. So, you know, so August 20th, 2019 is the 400th year anniversary. And I'm already here and talk about commemorations, things like this. What people have to understand, the Spanish were taking Africans into the territory we call South Carolina in the 1520s. So we need to stop saying that's when we first came to this land. And and and, and we were here for tens of thousands of years before that, the African people. Um, you read the first Americans were Africans documented evidence by Dr. David M. Hotel. He goes deep into that history. This was our land stolen from us. We were here before Native Americans came into existence. We were here in this land before Native Americans came into existence. Um, uh, Angela said, uh, I think if reparations were paid, it needs to be handled in a smart and concerted effort for the uplift of empowerment and financial needs based on need, based on needs, based on, uh, based on the needs of the black community. Uh, a think tank for reparations, uh, is needed. Uh, yeah, it, if we ever get reparations, the majority of it should not be in the form of money because we all got a million dollars a day. Europeans will have it all back this time next week. Uh, if you can research Tommy, Tommy Chancy Castle senior case happening now against the IRS Justice Department and OK, Marie uh, Bernadine. If anybody is. Um, in the Baltimore area, I'm coming to Baltimore Saturday, April 7th, Sunday, April 8th at the uh, UMBC Event Center for the uh, 17th annual uh, Baltimore Natural Hair Care Expo. And they'll be doing two workshops there, Great African Women in History, The Mothers of Civiliz Civilization. Cambella Ty said, how do I register for the course? Okay, we'll post the link again. Uh, Cambella, we'll post the link, uh, Campbell, I'm sorry, Campbell. I have new glasses, but you know, hell, this uh, the print is still small. <laughs> I'm sorry, Campbell Ty. There we go. We'll post a link again there. All right, uh, John. Okay, so search for the info. I'm going to continue, but I wanted to get to some of your uh, comments. Uh, TJ said, "Great, happy Easter Passover." Um, and I'm not sure if I'm going to have time today to deal with the history of Easter. I may post. Uh, I think I'm, I think I have a, a video of me talking about it on YouTube. I may post it here on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. Everybody follow our Facebook fan page, the African History Network also. OK. We're broadcasting on our fan page right now. Angela said breeding farms in the Caribbean, Puerto Rico, et cetera. Yeah. OK. All right. So let's continue here. So there was. Um, 
Jim said, did you just say blacks were here before Indians? Absolutely. You study, you study the history of African people, the, the Khoisan go all around the world. Um, Dr. Um, Albert Goodyear made a discovery in 2004 in Allendale County, South Carolina, and discovered an African presence going that date back at least 51,700 years ago. These were the Khoisan. Um, there's a reason why there have never been found any remains of Native Americans that are older than Homo sapiens, which is modern man. There's a reason why, because they didn't exist. Well, the African people, you found all different species, Australopithecus afarensis, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, okay, Homo sapien, Homo sapiens sapien. You found all different species of African people. Well, if Native Americans, you, the only, one, only ones you're going to find are Homo sapiens sapiens. Because so um, Asians come to this land that we call the United States of America about 3000 B.C. They intermix with the Africans who are already here. If you read, uh, if you read this book here, First Americans with Africans documented evidence by Dr. David M. Hotel. He thoroughly deals with this. His book has 713 footnotes. Um, it's backed up by seven peer review articles. You have Europeans who know this information. Dr. Albert Goodyear, who's an archaeologist at the University of South Carolina, is one of them. Okay, you have you have Europeans who know this, and uh, so they intermix the Africans who are already here and Asians who are already here. You have Africans who built the who built the mounds, the Khoisan built the mounds up and down the Mississippi River. Um, one of the, the one of the largest mounds that still exists is called Cahokia in uh, East Illinois, Cahokia. OK. So. What happens is, is uh, when European settlers come to this land, a lot of the indigenous African groups who are already here, a lot of them get reclassified as Native Americans. One. So we don't know who they are. Now, this is not saying the transatlantic slave trade did not happen. What I'm saying, instead of understanding the last 500 years of history, we need to understand the last 50,000 years of history. You have to understand a chronology of history. So yes, the transatlantic slave trade happened, but it didn't necessarily happen the way we've been taught that it happened. Then also you have to understand and study the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. You can't understand the transatlantic slave trade till you understand uh, the, uh, the Moors. Okay, so this is, this is why when I deal with the transatlantic slave trade and why I teach it, is different than some other people. Because I'm not dealing with the last 500 years of history, I'm dealing with the last at least 50,000 years of history, but I also deal with the last 300,000 years of history. So just very quickly, this is Dr. David M. Hotel. If you go to, if you go to our website, africanhistorynetwork.com, africanhistorynetwork.com, you can listen to the uh, uh, 11, I think 11 interviews I've done with them. We have the audio podcast there of the interviews I've done with them. You can listen to them and get more information. OK. Page 13 of his book deals with the discovery that Dr. Albert Goodyear, who's an archaeologist at the University of South Carolina, made um, in 2004 in Allendale County, South Carolina. Evidence of an African presence 51,000 years ago. They found, this is what they found. They found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprints in lava, genetic M174 D haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics, linguistics, paintings, skulls, skeleton structures, and tools. They found 13 different disciplines thoroughly documenting the African presence there. Doesn't mean the transatlantic slave trade didn't happen. Doesn't mean that, um, doesn't mean that we didn't come from Africa. No, we came from Africa much long, much earlier than we thought. That's what that did. That's, that's what that is. This is why you have to understand the chronology of history. Read this article from ScienceDaily.com, which is a scientific website, scientific journal, ScienceDaily.com. New evidence puts man in North America 50,000 years ago. Now, this is Dr. Albert Goodyear, who's a white archaeologist. 
radio now this is a summary in the article from sciencedaily.com this is a, this is their summary of what the article is about radiocarbon tests of carbonized plant remains where artifacts were unearthed last may along the savannah river in allendale county by university of south carolina archaeologist dr albert goodyear indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least fifty thousand years old meaning that humans inhabited north america long before the last ice age this is not my summary. This is what they said. This, this is what they said. This is 14 years ago. Why don't most of our people know this? We know August 20th, 16, 19. Why don't we know this? The reason why is because this was our land stolen from us. And if you understood that this was the land, this was our land stolen from African people, our whole perspective would change. We were here before anybody else was here. Yes, the transatlantic slave trade happened. But we have to be very clear. This is why when Europeans tell me go back to Africa, I'm like, do you really want me to tell you your history and where you came from? Because I understand our history and I understand your history. I say, no, this was our land stolen from us. You got it. You got it wrong. And you and you talking about I mean, see, Europeans are in no the Europeans. I don't mean any disrespect to anybody. Right. All Europeans don't think this way. But let's be very clear. Europeans are in no Europeans in this country are in no position to talk about illegal immigrants. They are in no position to talk about trying to keep immigrants out the country. Who the hell you think you are? Let's be clear on this. OK. Now. Do we want to keep criminals out of the country? Sure. What are we going to do about who sits at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue if you want to talk about criminals? If we look at the history of this country from 1611 to 1783, England emptied its jails and sent criminals to this country. Some of them were indentured servants early on. They're sending prostitutes. They're sending murderers. They're sending pickpockets. England emptied from 1611 to 1783. Read African People and European Holidays, A Mental Genocide by Dr. Ishaka Musa Barashando. Read that book. He deals with a chronology of history. You have, you have European historians who know this. England emptied its jails. So you want to talk about immigrants who are criminals? Really? You want to have that conversation? They're, they are in no position to have that conversation. Okay, so let's deal with this quickly, and then we'll, we'll, then we'll get back to uh, 1807. But somebody asked a question. So if you want to have that conversation, we can have that conversation. You know, <laughs> proper documentation is all conversation. I deal with facts and evidence. So let's look at this here. You can look this up yourself. You don't have to take my word for this. I tell people, you don't have to believe a word that I say. Go do your own research. Proper documentation ends all conversation. This is why I, pro I provide you with sources. You can go research this yourself. These are some of the things. These are some of the slides from the online course that I teach. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach in school. This is, this is some of the content. Because I do a... PowerPoint presentation just like this. So it's not on it's not on Facebook. It's at our online school. What I'm showing you right now, you can't do straight through Facebook. I'm using another technology to be able to show you these these this PowerPoint presentation. If you look at the 1828 edition of the Noah Webster Dictionary, you look up it's online. Look up the word American. It tells you that. Uh, uh, an American is a native of America. It says it originally applied to the aboriginals or copper colored races found here by the Europeans. Uh oh. American did not originally apply to Europeans. American applied to the aboriginals or copper colored races found in the Americas by the Europeans when the Europeans got to America. This is not an attack on anybody. I'm, I'm dealing with history. 
Okay, this is not, I'm not trying to attack anybody or anybody's ancestry or your ancestors or things like that. If you want to talk about whose ancestors were attacked, we can talk about African ancestors because it was our ancestors who were attacked. But now apply to the descendants of Europeans born in America. The original Americans were not Europeans. They were African people who were already in those lands, South America, Central America, this land we call North America, African people who were here. In South America, as Dr. David M. Hotep shows in this book, the Khoisan were there going back at least 56,000 years ago, but there's new evidence that pushes that date back to at least 100,000 years ago. These were African people. This was before Native Americans come into existence. So, once again, this is why I say, see, the way I deal with the transatlantic slave trade is different. We can't start in 1440 with the Portuguese getting involved. We can't start in 1419 with Prince Henry the Navigator sending ships around the west coast of Africa. You got to deal with that 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors, taking the teachings from ancient Kemet, from ancient Egypt into the Iberian Peninsula, the day known as Spain and Portugal. And they go all throughout Europe and totally change European history and change the complexion of some Europeans. But then you, you have to deal with the previous tens of thousands of years of history to understand that. So you have to deal with a chronology of history. All right, so let's continue. Let's continue. How's everybody doing? All right. So when you understand this history, right, and you understand this land belonged to African people and Native Americans, but African people, we were here first. Then that changes your whole perception, because unfortunately, we're taught to think of ourselves as guests in this land. We're taught to think of ourselves as first coming here conquered by Europeans and shackled in chains. No, that's not true. I'll debate anybody on that. That's not true. That's not what the evidence shows. Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene, one of my teachers, he deals with this information. That's not true. We were here tens of thousands of years before that. There's no disrespect to our African ancestors who fought against the transatlantic slave trade. That's just stating facts and evidence. Okay, let's continue. All right, so let's look at this article here from, and let me post this again because people are asked, how's everybody doing? Portu Portugal even used the religion around the world. Yes. Yeah, Portugal and Spain, they used the religion around the world. You're dealing with the Catholic Church. Catholic Church comes into existence in 11th century AD. Before then, you have the Eastern Orthodox Church. So you're going to have the Pope, you have the Treaty of Tordesillas in about uh, 1493, 1494, where the Pope divides the non-Christian world between Spain and Portugal and sends them out to conquer the non-Christian world. That's the that's the Treaty of Tordesillas. You have things like the Papal Bull of 1455, where the Pope tells Portugal and Spain, you good Christian nations, stop fighting amongst yourselves. I order you to reduce the servitude all infidel people. We hear Dr. John Henry Clark talk about that. I think he talked about that in the documentary, A Great and Mighty Walk, Dr. John Henry Clark, right? Because Spain and Portugal were the first ones involved in the transatlantic slave trade, and they were fighting and killing each other over these new territories because the, these European nations are coming out of the Dark Ages after they had uh, conquered the, 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 the Moors and, and took back um, territories from the Moors with the last stronghold, January 2nd, 1492 in Grenada. The Moors relinquished that, okay, and you know they're they're um, they're out sailing, conquering people's lands, and they're trying to rebuild Europe. Europe had lost um, uh, one quarter to one third of their population through the Black Death bubonic plague, which hits in 1347 to 1400 in the spurts. Um, they lose somewhere between 25 million and 75 million of their population in Europe. They're, they're, they're devastated. And they're trying to rebuild their land and they're searching for mineral wealth, they're searching for gold and silver, spices, and, and, they're, and they're trying to financially rebuild Europe also, okay? So it, this is why you have to understand uh, uh, a chronology of history. And Professor Kaba Kamene, formerly known as Booker T. Coleman, you've seen them in the Hidden Colors documentaries, you've seen interviews I've done with them. 
we're in the Black Friday documentaries together where uh, he's in um, 1804, The Hidden History of Haiti. He says, to understand the existence of something, you first have to understand the pre-existence of existence. To understand the existence of something, you first have to understand the pre-existence of existence, okay? All right. Uh, okay, did I post it again? Okay, I guess I did. Okay, I just posted the link again. All right. It says online course register here. All right. Okay, so this last article is a really good one. Now, this is from the New York Times. This is from Eric Foner. And Eric Foner is the white historian, but I've read a lot. I've read a lot of his articles. He has a lot of um, good information. There's a lot of good, good articles. This is from December 30th, 2007. So this is two days before the 200th year anniversary or the bicentennial of um, the uh, the bill going into effect, okay, of uh, the uh, abolishment of the um, international slave trade, of the African slave trade, uh, as far as the U.S. is concerned. It's called Forgotten Step Toward Freedom, Forgotten Step Toward Freedom. So Eric Foner says that, uh, F-O-N-E-R, Foner or Foner. He says that uh, we Americans live in a society awash in historical celebrations, okay? The last few years have witnessed commemorations of the bicentennial of the Louisiana Purchase in 2003. So we know it was signed in 1803, the Louisiana Purchase. The 60th anniversary of the end of uh, World War II, 2005. Um, and then he talks about uh, the upcoming anniversary of the bicentennial of Abraham Lincoln's birth in 2009, et cetera, right? And he said, but one significant milestone has gone strangely unnoticed, strangely unnoticed. The 200th year anniversary of January 1st, 1808, January 1st, 1808 when the importation of slaves into the United States was prohibited. We didn't hear a whole lot of talk about this. Also, I forgot to tell you all, register for, uh, uh, sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T to 22828 to sign up for our email newsletter also, because we send that out a few times a week and uh, we have articles, things like that in there. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828 to sign up for our email newsletters. I need to tell you before I forget. And we'll post that here also. Okay, let's continue here. And okay, put it right there. All right, so let's continue. All right, so um, he said then that uh, this neglect stands in striking contrast to the many scholarly and public events in Britain that marked the two the uh, 2007 bicentennial of that country's banning of the slave trade. There were historical conferences, museum exhibits, even a high budget film called Amazing Grace about William Wilberforce, William Wilberforce, the leader of the parliamentary crusade that resulted in abolition, okay? And this is who Wilberforce College is named after also. What explains this divergence? What explains this divergence, he asked. Now, throughout the 1780s, the horrors of the Middle Passage were, pub were widely publicized on both sides of the Atlantic. And by 1792, the British Parliament stood on the verge of banning the slave trade. OK, but when war broke out with revolutionary France, the idea was shelved. Final prohibition came in 1807, and it proved a major step toward the abolition of slavery in the empire, the British empire. The British campaign against the African slave trade not only launched the modern concern for human rights as an international principle, but today offers a usable past for a society increasingly aware of its multiracial character. It remains a historic chapter of which Britons, B-R-I-T-O-N-S, Britons, of all origins can be proud. He's talking about those that live in Britain, okay? Now, in the United States, however, slavery not only survived the end of the African trade, 
but embarked on an era of unprecedented expansion. Americans have had to look elsewhere for memories that ameliorate our racial discontents, okay? Which helps explain our recent focus on the 19th century Underground Railroad as an example, okay? As an example of blacks and whites working together in a common cause. And they, and they, they celebrate the Underground Railroad, okay? And it's oftentimes, even those widely commemorated is oftentimes exaggerated as well. It didn't start till about 1830, by the way, Underground Railroad. So nonetheless, the abolition of the slave trade to the, to the United States is well worth remembering, okay? Only a small fraction, perhaps 5% of Africans uh, enslaved were brought to the new world. Uh, in the four centuries of the slave trade uh, were destined for the area that became the United States. But in the colonial area, era, in the colonial era, Southern planters, Southern planters, Southern plantation owners, regularly purchased imported slaves and merchants in New York and New England. And, uh, and, and merchants in New York and New England profited handsomely from the trade, okay? In the colonial era, Southern planters regularly purchased imported slaves and merchants in New York and New England profited handsomely from the trade. Now, the American Revolution threw the slave trade and slavery itself into crisis. That's from 1775 to 1783, American Revolution. In the run up to the American Revolutionary War, Congress banned the importation of uh, of slaves as part of a broader non-importation policy. During the War of Independence, tens of thousands of African slaves escaped to the British side. Many accompanied the British out of the country when peace arrived. So the British were the first to say, if you come fight for us, if you come fight on our side, or on our side, when the war is over, we'll set you free. So you're gonna have more enslaved Africans who fought on the British side than fought on the U.S. side, okay? Low estimates are somewhere between 20 to 30,000 fight on the British side, only about 5,000 fight on the side of the colonies, all right? And that and those are low estimates. I've seen estimates as high as 80 to 100,000 fight on the British side. When the, when the American Revolutionary War is over with, those enslaved Africans that go to the British side, that they're then going to be dispersed into British territory. Some go on to Nova Scotia, Canada, because that was British territory. Some go on to Nova Scotia, Canada. Okay, so the American Revolution threw the slave trade and slavery into crisis in the run-up to a war. Congress banned the importation of slaves as part of a broader non-importation policy. During the War of Independence, Tens of thousands of slaves escaped to the British lines. Many accompanied the British out of the country when peace arrived. Inspired by the ideas of the revolution, most of the newly independent American states banned the slave trade. But importation resumed to South Carolina and Georgia which had been occupied by the British during the war and lost the largest number of slaves. Importation resumed to South Carolina and Georgia, which had been occupied by the British during the war and lost the largest number of slaves. Now the slave trade was a major source of disagreement at the, con at the con Constitutional Convention of 1787. Constitutional, uh, the Philadelphia Convention, right? Where, the drafting and debate in the U.S. Constitution. South Carolina's delegates were determined to protect slavery and they had a powerful impact on the final document. They originated the three-fifths clause, giving the South extra representation in Congress by counting part of its slave population and threatened this union if the slave trade were banned as other states demanded. So they're talking about the Three-Fifths Compromise of 1787, Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3 of the U.S. Constitution. Contrary to popular belief, it does not say and did not say 
to the African people were three fifths of a human being. It does not say and did not say that slaves were three fifths of a human being. You can go to loc.gov, which is the Library of Congress's website, and read that. So we need to stop. We need to stop saying that. That's not what that said. That dealt with how to count the enslaved population of African people for the purpose of apportionment and taxation. Apportionment deals with determining how many seats in the U.S. House of Representatives states are going to get. It's based upon population. So the question came up, how do you count the enslaved population of African people? The southern states wanted to, those, those southern states, they wanted to count the full population. Northern states are saying, if you count the full population, this is going to give you total dominance of the U.S. House of Representatives. You can just push through whatever bills you want through the U.S. House of Representatives. Most southern states had a smaller free population of people, but they had a larger total population when you add in the enslaved Africans. So they're going back and forth trying to figure out how do you determine how to count the enslaved population for the purpose of determining how many seats in the U.S. House of Representatives these slaveholding states like Virginia and South Carolina are going to have. So some people say, let's count half the population. Some people say, let's count three quarters of the population of enslaved Africans. They finally decide to go with three fifths, count three fifths of that population, which still gave the South dominance. Wasn't as much if you counted 100 percent of the population, it still gave them dominance. So that was the, that's that's what that was about. OK, I actually did a presentation. Uh, we have a presentation. All, all, all of my DVD lectures are available at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Okay? So I have a presentation I did uh, with the history of the Three Fifths Compromise of 1787 and also um, history of the Electoral College, because they both work together, the Electoral College as well. All right, so let's continue. Du, 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 Muslim Jew. Columbus never came to this land we call the United States of America. We have to stop saying Columbus came here. Columbus came to the Western Hemisphere. The closest Columbus came to this land mass we call the United States was Cuba, which is 90 miles away. Columbus never came to this land. This is why I show you where Columbus went on his four voyages. Columbus never came here, so we need to stop saying that. These are one of the things we deal with in the online course that I teach, because I deal with things chronologically. And you have to, before you can deal with Columbus, you have to deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors, because Columbus is using nautical instruments based upon the technology that the Moors introduced into Europe. Okay, so the slave trade was a major source of disagreement at the Constitutional Convention in 1787. South Carolina's delegates were determined to protect slavery and they had a powerful impact on the final document. They originated the three-fifths clause giving the South extra representation in Congress by counting part of the slave population and threatened disunion, threatened this disunion. If the slave trade was banned, as other states demanded, they threatened. So, so South Carolina threatened disunion if the slave trade were banned as other states demanded. OK, and keep in mind, see, South Carolina, like I said, is a very curious state. South Carolina is where the, the, the South Carolina is the first state to secede from the Union, secede from the Union, December 20 of 1860. South Carolina is is the is where the um, Civil War starts, April 12, 1861 also. Now, the result was a compromise barring Congress from prohibiting the importation of slaves until 1808. So this was this 20 year clause in the Constitution to protect those slave holding states, protect those states that wanted to maintain slavery, protect those delegates that advocated slavery. This was a 20 year clause. And as Dr. Linda Jeffries talks about, this gave them 20 years to fatten up and to profit more off of uh, the enslavement of African people. Some anti-federalists as opponents of ratifications uh, were called, cited the slave trade clause as a reason why the constitution should be rejected, claiming it brought shame upon the new nation. The outbreak of the slave revolution in Haiti 
in the early 1790s, it starts in 1791, Haitian Revolution. I think it was August 28th, um, 18, oh no, I think it was August, August uh, 21st, August 22nd, um, 1791. The outbreak of the uh, Haitian Revolution, um, 1791, sent shockwaves of fear through the American South and led to new state laws barring the importation of slaves. There was you 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 have to understand the Haitian Revolution. This scared the hell out of the slave holding. This scared the hell out of the slave holding nations, not just the U.S., but the slave holding European nations. This scared the hell out of them. So, because of the Haitian Revolution, takes place starts in 1791. In 1791 to 1803, they declared their independence January 1st, 1804. This sends shockwaves of fear throughout the American South, these, these slave holding states. And this leads the new states, uh, the new uh, state laws barring the importation of slaves because they're afraid they're going to import some slaves that will bring about a revolution here also. They said, oh, no, 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 no. We can't have that. We got to stop these immigrants from coming to America. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't immigrants, they were enslaved Africans, but still. <laughs> so the legislature of the newly acquired Louisiana Territory also allowed the importation of slaves. I'm sorry, I skipped the sentence. But in 1803, as cotton cultivation spread, South Carolina reopened the slave trade, okay? Because of because of the cotton industry and because you have um, the acquisition of the uh, Louisiana the Louisiana Territory, but also um, you, you have the cotton gin as well. Which the, what the cotton gin and copies of the cotton gin does is it um, makes it more profitable. It reduces the overall cost of producing cotton because the cotton gin was a device that more efficiently pick the seeds out of cotton, right? And it makes it, it reduces the overall cost to produce cotton. This is gonna make uh, producing cotton more profitable. It makes the production of cotton products more profitable as well. In 1803, as cotton cultivation spread, South Carolina reopened the slave trade. The, the state, the, the uh, legislature of the newly acquired Louisiana Territory also allowed the importation of slaves. From 1803 to 1808, between 75,000 and 100,000 Africans entered the United States. Now, that's probably a low ball number. By this time, the international slave trade was widely recognized as a crime against humanity. In 1807, Congress prohibited the importation of slaves from abroad to take effects to take effect the next New Year's Day, the first date allowed by the U.S. Constitution. Because remember, see, the U.S. Constitution had that 20 year clause built in protecting the importation of African slaves. OK, so the earliest that the earliest that the prohibition could go into effect was January 1st, 1808. So that the bill passed March 2nd, 1807 was 20, basically 20 years in the making. It didn't just happen. Europeans didn't just come to some moral epiphany. There was a, <laughs> the 20 year clause was put into the constitution to protect these slaveholding states that wanted to keep profiting off of the importation of enslaved Africans. Now, for years thereafter, free African Americans, free African Americans celebrated January 1st as an alternative to July 4th, the 4th of July, right? The 4th of July. When, in their view, patriotic orators hypocritically proclaimed the slave owning United States a land of liberty, right? 
the 4th of July is hypocritical because they're talking about their independence while they are enslaving African people. It is easy to understand, however, why the trade's abolition appears so anticlimactic. Banning American participation in the slave trade did not end the shipment of Africans to the Western Hemisphere. Some, according to their numbers, some three million more slaves were brought to Brazil and Spanish America, Spanish America, before the trade finally ended, with Southerners dominating the federal government for most of the period uh for most of the period before the Civil War, enforcement was lax and the smuggling of slaves into the United States continued, as I said earlier. Yeah, the, even though they have this, this um, passed this bill, this federal bill, Europeans continued to bring Africans uh, uh, into this country. Now, those who hope that ending American participation in the slave trade would weaken or destroy slavery were acutely disappointed. In the United States, unlike the West Indies, the slave population grew from natural increase. In the United States, unlike the West Indies, the slave population grew from natural increase. This was not because American owners were especially humane but because most of the South lies outside the tropical environment where diseases like yellow fever and malaria exacted a huge toll on whites and blacks alike. So you had high casualties in the um, uh, Caribbean areas because of these diseases. And they were attacking enslaved Africans and attacking Europeans as well. So as slavery expanded into the deep south, a flourishing internal slave trade replaced importation from Africa. Between 1808 and 1860, the economies of older states like Virginia came increasingly to rely on the sale of slaves to the cotton fields of Alabama, Mississippi and Louisiana. But demand for outstripped, but demand far outstripped supply, and the price of slaves rose inexorably, placing ownership outside the reach of poor Southerners. So, what's taking place between 1808 to 1860? You're going to see an increase in the slave breeding, increase in the slave breeding farms, right? But as I said earlier, even though this law goes into place, this federal law goes into place January 1st, 1808, the importation of enslaved Africans still continues. As we see from the article from Black Agenda Report from uh, Dr. Jahi Issa and uh, brother Reggie Marbury entitled, uh, Reparations is dead. Authors seek to spark public discussion on new legal strategy. Reparations is dead. Authors seek to spark public discussion on new legal strategy. And I interviewed both these brothers on my radio show, the African History Network show. You can listen to the two part interview I did with them at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And uh, just click on on the homepage, click on listen to podcasts of Michael M. Hotel, and then just search for reparations. It takes you to our blog talk radio page where we have 800 and over 800 audio podcasts. But as they talk about in their article, uh, somewhere between 3.5 to 4 million enslaved Africans are still brought to the U.S. from 1808 to uh, 18, from 1808 to about 1865 or so, 1808 to 1861, something like that are still brought to the U.S., violating, violating uh, federal law. So what they talk about is when it comes to trying to achieve reparations, not only do we have to know the law, but we have to focus in on that period of time where the U.S. violates their own laws. They, they, they violate federal law. 
The U.S. violates federal law. Trying to get reparations for 246 years of slavery is not going to work and hasn't worked because it was largely legal. But from 1808 to 1861 or 1865, you can focus in on this period of time when the U.S. is in violation of their own federal law, the importation. OK, all right. Because what's, what's taking place is many of us are going to a legal court to make a moral argument, and that's not going to work. It has not worked, and it's not going to work. You do not go to a legal court to make a moral argument. You go to a legal court to debate law. Unfortunately, you have people who mean well, some of them mean well, and they're going to a legal court to make a moral argument. You don't do that. Okay, so let's continue. So as slavery expanded into the Deep South, a flourishing internal slave trade replaced importation from Africa. Between 1808 and 1860, the economies of older states like Virginia came, be, uh, came increasingly to rely on the sale of slaves to the cotton fields of Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. But demand far outstripped supply. The demand for enslaved Africans far outstripped the supply of enslaved Africans. And the price of slaves rose inexorably, placing ownership of slaves outside the reach of poor white Southerners. Let us imagine that the African slave trade had continued in a legal and open manner well into the 19th century. It is plausible to assume that hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Africans would have been brought into the country. This most likely would have resulted in the democratization of slavery as prices fell and more and more whites could afford to purchase slaves along with a further increase in Southern political power thanks to the Constitution's three-fifths clause, okay? And I repeat that. This most likely would have resulted in the democratization of slavery as prices fail and more and more whites could afford to purchase slaves, along with a further increase in Southern political power thanks to the Constitution's three-fifths three -fifths clause, okay? Which dealt with determining how determining how many seats in the House of Representatives Southern slaveholding states are going to have. How do you count these, this population of enslaved Africans? And this gives them more, it gave the Southern states more representation in the House of Representatives. Now, these were the very reasons advanced by South Carolina's political leaders when they tried unsuccessfully to reopen the African slave trade in the 1850s. They're talking about the importation, reopen the importation of enslaved Africans. More slaves would also have meant heightened fear of revolt and ever more stringent controls on the slave population. It would have reinforced Southerners' demands to annex to the United States areas suitable for plantation slavery in the Caribbean and Central, uh, Central America. Had the importation of slaves continued unchecked, the United States could well have become the hemispheric slave-based empire of which many Southerners dreamed. January 1st, 1808 is worth commemorating, not only for what it directly accomplished, but for helping to save the United States from a history even more terrible than the Civil War that eventually rid the U.S. of uh, slavery because of the 13th Amendment, chattel slavery because of the 13th Amendment. Eric Foner is a professor of history at uh, Columbia University. All right, uh, we'll go to some of your comments here. What is this here? Okay, we posted that. That's the article from uh, Black Agenda Report. Uh, we're posting from... Uh, Dr. Jahi Issa and uh, Brother Reggie Marbury. Okay. And how's everybody doing? How y'all like this type of information? 
those just tuning in, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, and writer. Be sure to visit our uh, uh, website, africanhistorynetwork.com, africanhistorynetwork.com as well. Okay, let's see here. Let's go to some of your comments. Um, let's see. All right. If you like this type of information, also register for uh, our online uh, classes that I teach. So I deal with one, I have one, uh, my most popular one, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. That's a seven session, 14 hour online course. There's 20 hours of bonus content. These are all on demand. And um, you can register for them individually. We just posted the link there. You can also go to AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And we have a six course online bundle pack, which is the best value. Uh, it's six month online courses for $80, regularly $120. And that includes the uh, one I just did uh, yesterday, dealing with the film Black Panther. All right, so let's go to some of your comments here. Let me try to pull this up here. All right, Perry, Angela, uh, the American Constitution, Norris laws are written to protect blacks. They're written for and by whites. Uh, we have to we have to understand how to use them. Originally, they didn't apply to us. They apply to us now. We just don't understand how to use them because many of us don't understand law. We have to understand how to use them. Um, okay. All right. So if you're just tuning in, we're talking about, uh, I did not get a chance to talk about this in March. Well, March 2nd, uh, 2018 was the anniversary of Congress passing the bill to abolish the uh, importation of enslaved Africans into this country. So that's what we're talking about some and in the transatlantic slave trade as it pertains to the US, the Civil War, et cetera. Uh, Joseph said, the straw, Larry Hill, the straw man is for any man, not just black thing that separates black from whites in the Constitution. It's black, the thing that separates blacks from whites in the Constitution. All right. So he's talking about the straw man. He's talking about the UCC and all of that. We have treaties that supposed to protect us, peace and friendship. Treaty of peace and friendship dealt with subjects of Morocco. Unless you are a subject of Morocco, treaty of peace and friendship does not apply to you. Treaty of peace and friendship, 1786 and 1787, applied to subjects of Morocco. Some Africans some Africans were Moors, not all, not, not all Africans were Moors. Uh, no treaty that America has ever entered has been respected. Look at the EPA now. Uh, US violated over 371 peace treaties with Native Americans. If you read uh, how black folks, if you read how white folks got so rich, the untold story of American white supremacy from Nation of Islam Research Group. If you read that book, they talk about that in there. So U.S. has violated all of their treaties. We could try to enforce them, but just keep in mind, you know, they violated all their treaties that they signed. Not black, this is Morocco. All this land was not Morocco. Part of it was Morocco. All this land mass was not Morocco. And for that for that treaty to apply to you, you had to be a subject of Morocco. That that the Treaty of Peace and Friendship applied to subjects of Morocco. Morocco was here, but all this land was not Morocco. All right. Um. Uh, 
And then the other thing is theory is different than actual practical application. So you have a theory. Now go ahead and try to enforce it. All right. So let's continue here. Uh, so I showed you some of the slides, some of the because when I do the online presentation, when I do the um, do the online classes, we do a PowerPoint presentation. It's part of it. We have video clips, things like that. So these are some from the actual online class. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach them in school. So here's some of the things that we deal with, and it's all on demand. You can go back and watch it over and over again. Also, we have a, a if you like DVDs, we have an eight DVD bundle pack of eight of my lectures at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com on sale right now, eighty dollars. That includes uh, my presentation dealing with the distortion of the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The revolution that the revolutionary will not be televised on the television. African American resistance in the era of Donald Trump, voter suppression, reparations, and how elections have consequences. Also, um, the racist history of the white national anthem and the Pledge of Allegiance. Those are just a few of the presentations in that. Uh, that's called the Breaking the Chains Bundle Pack. That's available at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. All right, so here's some things that we, that we deal with in the um, online um, class. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. What was the transatlantic slave trade? What were some of the events that led up to it starting? What role did Christopher Columbus play? Christopher Columbus is crucial in understanding the spread of the transatlantic slave trade, the spread of racism and capitalism and exploitation of indigenous people. Capitalism does not have to be a bad thing. It's, it's the way it's practiced. It's the way some people practice it. When did Africans first come to the U.S. as, as enslaved Africans? Did Africans set themselves into slavery? We did with that complicated history because it's largely misrepresented by Europeans. And some people like Dr. Heron Lewis Gates Jr. misrepresented. Were African people in America before the slave trade? Yes, we were. There was the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors, shocking archeological discoveries that are causing experts to rethink everything. Because these archeological discoveries that are taking place is just blowing archeologists' minds, paleontologists' minds, paleontologists' minds, scientists' minds, et cetera. And they're pushing the dates back. They're, they're having to push the dates back of migrations, push the dates back of the oldest known fossils of modern man, like the like the discovery that came out of uh, Morocco, Morocco in Africa, not El Morocco, which was here, but Morocco in Africa, northern Africa, in June or July of 2017, they found skeletons of modern man, homo sapiens, that date back 300,000 to 350,000 years ago. This is over 100,000 years older than the oldest fossils they found in Ethiopia, which date back 195,000 years ago. So it's causing them, so the deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets, the more research they do, the older we get. So it's causing them to have to rethink everything. Okay, so we talk about uh, the role insurance companies uh, played as well. Insurance companies took out insurance policies on slave ships as well as enslaved Africans on the plantations. He had over 40 insurance companies in the U.S. that took out insurance policies on enslaved Africans on the plantation. Probably the most popular one was the Nautilus Mutual Life Insurance Company, founded the spring of 1845 in Manhattan, and they later became known as the New York Life Insurance Company. Uh, we do a Freemasonry, America and the Founding Fathers, uh, origins of the term America and Africa, and uh, a lot more. OK, so we try to deal with things chronologically because you have to understand a chronology of history as well. All right. It's extremely important. Uh, we deal with the problem with slave movies and why we why we being bombarded with slave movies and the slave themed TV show. Uh, we talk about ancient Kemet and Osara, Aset and Heru. The Greeks call them Osiris, Isis, and Horus, the origins of the Immaculate Conception story. Links to ancient Kemet, Egypt, uh, and early Christianity. 
fake Willie Lynch letter 1712, because Willie Lynch never historically existed, and a lot more. So we do, we do, this is some of what we deal with in the online course, okay? Let's go to some more, let's go to some more of your comments, we'll get out of here. So if you like this type of information, we'll post a link again. Um, you can register for our online courses. You can also go to AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And uh, we have a bundle pack which saves you money. Now you can, you can view these from around the world on your smartphone, on your tablet, on your computer. Google Chrome works best. The browser Google Chrome, Google Chrome works best. These are all on demand and it includes the one that I did Saturday, March 31st, 2018, dealing with the film Black Panther as well. All right. Let's go with some of and, uh, and then also my you can read all of my articles that I write at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, my DVD lectures are there as well if you want to order those. And that, that all helps support the African History Network because this is a lot of work. And it helps pay the bill, helps us stay on the air on online school. I got to pay for that. Blog Talk Radio, I have to pay for that. So it helps us to help support the African History Network. Uh, we'll go to some, well, a couple more of your comments, then we'll get out of here. TJ said I was stationed in Tangier, Morocco in 1976. Uh, I'll set Bast, which is short for Bastet, which is a netter. And this is uh, who Bast, the deity that watches over Wakanda is named after, was the Black Panther Bastet. And ancient Kemet was depicted as a, as a black cat. She said, you said it right. We have to figure out how to use the law to benefit us. Uh, Douglas said, so why isn't a law to protect the law? Uh, okay. Joseph said, that's correct. My brother, you have to claim that nationality uh, prove it's your bloodline, Brother Larry. Most important thing is practical application. Most important thing is actually implementing. I've heard all the theories. I've been to classes of the Moors. I understand the treaties. I know Washita Moors, all this. At the end of the day, we have to see where this is actually being implemented and working. I've seen the theories. I've seen videos of Moors debating police. I've seen videos of Moors getting arrested by police, getting tackled. At the end of the day, it's actually getting all this stuff implemented and actually working. All right. Gregory, no, I won't be on at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. May do a Facebook Live broadcast. I'm not sure. I have to see how I feel. But uh, 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation won't be on uh, because they're running reruns. Um, that's one of the reasons why I'm on now. They're running reruns because it's Easter. Okay. So I want to do my show live tonight, but. Um, they decided because not enough hosts wanted to do it live, you know, they have to pay the board operators to come in to do it. So they said they're not going to they're not going to do it to save the money. All right. So for those who wanted to know, um, I forgot to tell you, the six courses in our online bundle pack, online course bundle pack at our online school. Our ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'apa understand the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach in school. Great African women in history, the mothers of civilization. How Richard Nixon's war was, uh, how, Nixon, how Richard Nixon's war on drugs was a war on the African American community. African American resistance in the era of Donald Trump, voter suppression, reparations, and high elections have consequences. Um, my online lecture uh, analysis of the film Black Panther and its cultural influence in African history. So that's on demand. I just I just did that. And also Empire Strikes Black, the propaganda, the media. OK, so those are in the six online course bundle pack. All right. 
for those who are wondering. Something else I was going to tell you. Oh, yeah, I'll be in Baltimore. Uh, one, if you want to donate to the African History Network, you can do that at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Right on the home page, click on the yellow uh, donate button. So if you want to help support, you can do that. Donate there. You can also buy, you know, buy a DVD lecture, sign up for online classes. That helps as well. Some people just want to donate. That's fine. Those in Baltimore, I'll be at the Baltimore Natural Hair Care Expo once again. Um, 17th Annual Baltimore Natural Hair Care Expo. This year's special guest is actress Jennifer Lewis from the TV show Blackish. Actress Jennifer Lewis from the TV show Blackish. She'll be there. It's going to be a huge turnout. I'll have a vendor booth there. I'm doing two workshops, one Saturday, one Sunday. Um, dealing with great African women in history, the mothers of civilization, and the film Black Panther. Okay. Saturday, uh, April 7th, Sunday, April 8th at the UMBC Event Center. UMBC Event Center uh, in Baltimore, Maryland. 1000 Hilltop Circle, Baltimore, Maryland. Um, go to AfricanHistoryNetwork.com for more information. AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can also go to um, NaturalHairCareExpo.com also. NaturalHairCareExpo.com as well. And uh, it's twenty dollars admission. I think that's twenty dollars per day. You have to check that out. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't set the price or anything like this. You get admission to most of the uh, workshops through the twenty dollar cover charge, twenty dollar admission. So my workshop is included in that. All right. All right. Uh, let's see. I signed up for the very first class you have. We'll still have access to the class. I took. Oh, yeah. You still have access, uh, Gregory. Yeah. You still have access to the first class you attended. You can watch these over and over and over again. Just so people understand these online classes, you can watch them over and over and over again. So, Greg, yeah, you still have access to the class you uh, signed up for. If you can't get in, just email me, uh, Greg, uh, customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Dot com. Email me if you can't get in. Uh, TJ Jennifer Lewis will be promoting her book. Uh, I think so. Let me see. This flyer is small. I can't read this right. Yeah, I think so. I think she'll be promoting the book. Bianca Golden will be there, who uh, is a model. I think she was on uh, America's Next Top Model. Uh, this is put on by Malika Cooper. The Baltimore one, I think, is probably the largest one. It's a two day one. Uh, I, I go to, I'm, I've been in some of the other ones have been a um, speaker, but I, I usually do the Baltimore one because it's a two day one. That's usually the largest one. So come on out those in the Baltimore area as well. All right. OK, look, we got to get out of here. Hey, remember at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world, because right now it's correct wrong behavior. Uh, what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself and what you allow other people to do to you based upon what you think about yourself, what you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself, what you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. Also, um, those that uh, want to donate to the African History Network, that helps me to uh, pay to travel to this Baltimore Expo, because even though I get a free vendor booth, I don't, I don't get paid to speak there and do these workshops, anything like that. So I got to pay out of pocket to travel. So that helps to uh, support what we're doing here because this this is not a joke i mean this this stuff is not cheap all right remember right now is correct wrong behavior is not over, over till we win wakanda forever we'll talk to you next time peace <laughs>